privilege it is for us to be able to come together and freely worship God. Um, instead of having our worship team like we usually do up here um, leading us in music today, we're going to do another hymn sing-along like we did earlier in the year. And this week, when I was trying to um, decide and ask God what he wanted us to sing today, this song kept kind of popping through my head. It was, it's an old hymn called Brethren We Have Met to Worship. Um, so I went to the hymnal and I looked for it and lo and behold, it's, it's not in our hymnal anymore. <clears throat> but it, they did come out with, or somebody um, did a rewrite, an updated version of the old hymn. And at first I was a little disappointed that I couldn't find the one that I grew up with. But um, I really do like the words that have been put to this updated version. Um, you know, it, it caused me to have some heart questions, such as when we enter into those doors into the sanctuary, uh, do we come expecting God to speak to us? And do we enter depending on the Holy Spirit to be here? The song talks about um, how God bought each and every one of us in this room here today with such a great cost by sacrificing his only son. And it also mentions in the lyrics how, you know, we all have different things we're going through in life, and we don't know what's going on in the life of the person that's in front of us or behind us. And um, God wants us to reach out and to help others and to also um, tell others about him, those who are lost. So um, the hymn also, the verses end with, holy manna will be showered all around. So what does that mean? That's not something we normally hear people saying in this day and age. Um, are we going to find bread falling from the ceiling today? Um, well, if God wanted to, he could, like he did with the Israelites. But um, in this song, when we're talking about holy manna, we're synonymously saying God's provision and his blessings for us. And if we're prayerfully asking that of him today, he's not going to let us down. So um, if you're able, I want everyone to stand and worship with the Lord, um, expecting that he will speak to us and that he's going to shower us with his holy manna. And at any time, if you get tired of standing, feel free to sit and you can pop back up again if the Spirit urges you to. So join me in singing, We Have Come to Join in Worship. Praise yet our Christ again. Amen. 
but I want to be there when that happens. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound in time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us lay before the master from the dawn to setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the Thank you, Matt. Well, it's really a privilege to be with you here this morning again, and it uh, just feels like coming home, and, uh, and I guess it is, uh, if, if home is where your wife is. My wife is usually here on Sunday mornings, as you know, those who are, those who are new. It's good to see some new faces, but uh, she's the one with a keyboard and uh, once in a while a mandolin. So anyway, uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be invited. Thanks, Pastor Matt, for uh, that. Even though I'm officially re- retired, uh, and consider, of course, you are a church family. Uh, in retirement, I've made myself available to uh, minister to congregations in a pulpit fill sort of a capacity. And so for the last eight months, I've been down in uh, Levere's, a little town that was founded in 1906 by the DuPont Company. And let's see, am I getting up there? Is the clicker working? Anyway, I, I'll fill a little bit here. But uh, okay. There we go. Great. Thank you. Uh, but anyway, yeah, a little uh, town that was founded in 1906 uh, called the Veers, uh, and uh, where they manufactured dynamite and fertilizer and things like that. And there's a little sister church that's between pastors, and so it's been my privilege uh, for the last eight months to be down there on Sunday mornings, even while Sharon is here. Well, if you have your Bibles, please take them, turn in them, where else but to Colossians chapter 4. We stopped our study uh, about a year ago. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I'm afraid I'm, I'm very predictable. And so you could figure I was just going to pick up, but going to pick up where we left off and continue. So I hope you're okay with that. Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, uh, that we'll be looking uh, at that in a few moments. But um, of course, it goes without saying that, that these are very complicated, complex, and challenging times that we live in as a culture, as believers, as the local church. Of course, the daily news is just filled with discouraging, discouraging stories, crime, injustice, strife, conflict, people's rights violated, sickness, disease, death, suffering, government failings, government overreach, people taking advantage of others, marriages failing, families breaking up, on and on and on, wars, rumors of wars. Boy, I just got a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach when I heard about uh, Taiwan and China and what's going on there. And uh, we should certainly need to pray in that regard. Natural calamities, on and on it goes. And of course, the news just merely confirms what we already know as believers, that we live in a, just a fallen and a broken world, a world for whom Christ died. As uh, Lisa, of course, so articulately said, how do you follow something like that? But, uh, and, and we have the message of redemption in the gospel. But these are challenging times for churches as well. Uh, a recent survey reveals that uh, these challenges began well before the COVID pandemic, which of course has affected Red Rocks Fellowship and uh, the church where I'm currently filling in in Levere's and, and all around. It, it finds that half of the country's estimated 350,000 religious congregations had 65 or fewer people in attendance on any given weekend, uh, a drop of more than half from the median level of 137 people in the year 2000, 21 years ago, when the data was first being collected uh, for this survey. It uh, found 
uh, that uh, mainline Protestants suffered the greatest decline over the past five years of 12.5%, a median of 50 people attending worship in 2020. Um, Catholic, Orthodox Christian churches declined by 9%. Evangelical congregations, it says, declined at a slower rate, 5.4%, over the same five-year period, and they were the ones with the median attendance of 65 people at worship. Uh, it finds that mid-sized churches with an attendance of 100 to 250 have declined the most precipitously. Uh, the median decline was 12%. Now, that's discouraging. I want to be encouraging this morning. There is good news, but uh, th this is the report that comes on the heels of the uh, 2020 annual State of the Church report in which Barner reported that practicing Christians are now a much smaller segment of the entire population. In 2000, 45% of all those sampled qualified as practicing Christians, a share that has consistently declined over the last, at that point, 19 years. But now, just one in four Americans, 25%, is a practicing Christian. In essence, the share of practicing Christians has nearly dropped in half since 2000, according to this very sobering Barna report. And we might ask, well, how do they define a practicing Christian? And you may be surprised by this. Quote, Practicing Christians identify as Christian, agree strongly that faith is very important in their lives, and have, a church, have attended church within the past month. Wow. <laughs> that was a surprise to me. For many of us, that's a very generous definition. And what it tells me is that we have a huge mission field to reach right here in our own culture, don't we? A huge mission feature uh, field in our culture, in this rapidly changing culture. Now, I know that you as a congregation are praying, co-laboring with Pastor Matt, the church staff, elders, leadership team, to meet with God's help, the challenges that we as believers face on a daily basis, and that many similar churches are experiencing too as well. So what can we do? How are we to respond to such challenges that could be discouraging as well? Well, I'd suggest today that we must respond to challenges in the same way that the Apostle Paul instructed a small, struggling first century church in the Asia Minor town, province more accurately, in the province of Asia Minor in Colossae. Now, as we've studied and you've read Colossians and uh, perhaps remember that they had a lot going for them in terms of faith and hope and love. The apostle commended them for that. And we as a church, Red Rocks Fellowship, have a lot going for us too in that regard. What Colossians, the Colossians were being challenged by, of course, was the false teaching of what which uh, one teacher, uh, MacArthur actually, has described as a conglomeration of human philosophy, legalism, mysticism, and asceticism, perhaps some, uh, as they've uh, understood it as an incipient form of Gnosticism. But even while the challenges that you and I may, uh, that have that may differ from what the Church of Colossae experienced, yet God is on the throne regardless of the challenges. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so having reminded in the earlier context of Colossians of the supremacy, reminded them of the supremacy of Jesus Christ in His person and in His finished work, and the completeness of salvation in Him in chapters 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul has moved on to the specifics of the Christian life in chapters 3 and following, chapters 3 and 4 specifically, of how Christians are to live in challenging times as those who are rooted and grounded in Christ and how they are to walk in Him, to live in Him with the transformed lives that the indwelling Christ enables. Transformed lives are lives of positive life, positive life attitudes in what might be described as a culture that is a negative and everybody's a victim type cancel culture. Transformed lives are of transformed morality in a skeptical and questioning post-Christian, post-modern, sexually immoral culture. Lives that are transformed 
in terms of the dynamic interpersonal relationships in an insulated social media driven type cancel culture, transformed committed relationships in a culture in which marriages are challenged and, uh, and transformed too in, in family life and in terms of even uh, purpose driven exemplary work life uh, in what, what we might call a, a welfare state mentality that seems to be infecting our culture these days. Well, as uh, when we left off in the study about a year ago now, the Apostle had encouraged the Colossians and us by application and in so many words in the midst of all this to devote ourselves to prayer and, and to pray for opportunities to share the gospel clearly as in the immediately preceding verses. If the clicker will respond, there we go. <laughs> It goes to sleep, okay? I, and I hope I'm not putting you to sleep. That, that, that may be a constant thing here. Anyway, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Proclaim that I may procl proclaim it clearly as I should. And so here in the context of prayer and of evangelism, the Apostle Paul turns now, and that's kind of the, these are kind of hinge verses, to shift our attention to how Christians are relate to a skeptical, a cynical, a, a questioning, unbelieving culture in two areas. First of all, mainly our lifestyle, specifically how we live, how we walk, how we conduct our lives, and also our speech. <laughs> how we speak, the words we use, what, what we say, what, what we communicate. And so it's certainly in contrast to a spiritually lethargic culture that's so wrapped up in the daily affairs of life or worse. In contrast, believers are called, we are called to be purposeful in the way we live. And so I'm calling that strategic living. And we want to keep in mind that strategic living is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. It's God's end because it's a world out there that he's calling us to reach and to impact for his kingdom with a winsome gospel message. Almost like those people who are active in the social media and are called influence, influencers and, and not always influencers for good. We are called to be influencers to influencers that reach our world with the gospel. And so look with me here, if you will, at Colossians chapter 4, verse 5, which we're going to focus on for a few minutes here. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every, every opportunity. Father, we just ask that God the Holy Spirit who has given these words through the inspired pen of the Apostle Paul might illumine our hearts and minds to the truth of your holy word in a life transforming way, Father, as we spend a few moments here focusing upon that. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Notice with me this first that strategic living is about a wise and opportunistic lifestyle that I see there in verse 5. As Christians, we're on display to the world. People watch you and me very, very closely. They scrutinize us to see if our lives match up with what we claim to believe. And so this is why to give a very literal re reading of these words of the Apostle Paul, we need to, as it's literally rendered below, in wisdom walk before those outside the time purchasing. So to, by application, unpack a little more, I'd like to suggest first that strategic living takes a wife, wise lifestyle. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. And unfortunately, it's so much easier to find illustrations of Christians who have not been wise in the way they have acted before the unbelieving world. Uh, tragically, among Christian leaders, the tales abound of televangelists and prominent pastors and the like who, with basically their moral and financial foibles. Uh, in this last week's news, a prominent pastor is suing another prominent pastor. Uh, another story is about a pastor and his wife stealing church funds charged with a felony in Texas. Uh, another is about a youth pastor involved with a 14-year-old girl in his youth group in a very inappropriate way. Flagrant cases. But the sad fact of the matter is that the battle for souls is often lost uh, because of what we might consider insignificant issues. Careless talk, reckless driving, 
dishonest business dealing, character issues, all these things that hurt and mar the Christian testimony. Uh, I knew of a pastor who didn't mow his lawn, water his lawn, and basically has a testimony that's zilch in his neighborhood. Another, uh, actually a pastor that I small, uh, followed in a small town where I first pastored, his effectiveness was hurt because he always was turning U-turns there. In that little town of a thousand, Phillips, South Dakota, he just kind of was casual, just did U-turns in the streets, and that hurt his testimony. I uh, heard Christians carry pockets full of tracts, but because of how they treated others, they have minimal opportunities for verbal witness. And we might ask, well, what is a wife's wise lifestyle that we're talking about? Well, it, it's a life of wisdom, isn't it? First, it begins with a wisdom of reverence toward God. As we see in Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. There's the wisdom of Solomon. who said, Proverbs 11.30, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. There's the wisdom of Christ, the one greater than Solomon. Okay, it's smarter than me. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? Oh, there we go. Okay. Actually, I should be used to this. The one in Levere's doesn't work that well either. <laughs> it's following me. Um, uh, the wisdom of Christ. There we go. The one greater than Solomon. It's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption, and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. I keep asking in Ephesians 1, 17, a uh, parallel epistle, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better and the wisdom of accepting the word of God. Uh, to quote from Jeremiah 8, verse 9, the opposite, uh, the wise will be put to shame, they will be dismayed and trapped since they have rejected the word of the Lord. What kind of wisdom do they have? Basically, the wisdom of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the wisdom of the Word of God that we have. So, first of all, strategically, live wisely. Live wisely. The story is told of an evangelist who is holding revival services in a town. And I guess my blank is not showing up there. Is it, is, I, I can't make it go blank either, can I? Okay. All right. All um, right. Anyway, uh, stories told of an evangelist, and uh, he uh, wanted to mail a letter, so he left his motel room to search for a post office. And uh, on the cor corner was a boy that was standing there, and he asked him uh, how to find it, and uh, he got a prompt, clear answer from that little boy. And uh, he said, thank you to him. He said, you're a bright young youngster. Uh, do you know who I am? And the boy looked at him for a moment and said, uh, I'm sorry, I don't, sir. And the minister then explained he was an evangelist, that he was preaching in a nearby church, and uh, he invited this boy to attend, saying, well, if you come tonight, I'll show you the way to heaven. Uh, well, no thank you, sir, the boy said politely. Uh, I'm afraid I couldn't take your word for it. Um, you know, you don't even know the way to the post office. <laughs> you know, we need to be wise in the way we conduct our lives and how we relate to others. So when the opportunities for outreach come, uh, we're prepared to utilize them fully and take the full advantage. Uh, the word that the Apostle Paul uses here, exagorazo, that particular word, means to buy up, to ransom, figuratively to rescue from loss, to improve opportunity in terms of redeeming the time. A.T. Robertson says, we all have the same time, he says, Paul goes into the market and buys it up using it rightly. And so I'd suggest that strategic living also involves not only living wisely, but having an opportunistic lifestyle. Make the most of every opportunity. To the Ephesians, as you see the parallel familiar passage, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And of course, we're familiar with that Latin phrase, carpe diem, seize the day, as is popularly rendered. I guess that's debatable how they 
uh, translated. But uh, we know as Moses surveyed and, and observed his generation that is in the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and reflected upon the brevity of life, he concluded this in his prayer in Psalm 90. Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We hear it said that time is money. Thought I was going to get a blank there. Uh, but think about this. If you had a bank that credited to your account each morning $86,400 that carried over no balance from day to day and every evening canceled out the amount that you failed to use, what do you think you'd do? $86,400. And of course, uh, common sense would tell you to draw it out, right? To, to use every cent. Well, in a sense, you and I have such a bank. And its name is time. Every morning, the Lord credits you and me with 86,400 seconds. And every night rules off at a loss whatever this treasure that you and I have failed to utilize and invest to a good purpose. There's no going back. There's no drawing against tomorrow. You and I must live in the present on today's deposit. And therefore, by application, we must invest those moments that are fleeting so fast so that in eternity we'll have no regrets about time. And someone says, well, that's okay. I, I'm fine with living the way that God wants me to live, uh, but I'm not a preacher. I'm not an evangelist. Many years ago, I was uh, working uh, to develop a Christian radio network. Uh, and at the time, uh, the radio station I was working for, we actually received tapes, reel-to-reel tapes in the mail, and uh, that, that's how the programs were distributed. Satellite technology was in, in its early stages. It was way too expensive, and so we needed to find another more affordable way to distribute the signal of that particular radio station to other uh, cities uh, in Colorado specifically. And I'd uh, learned that the local PBS stations were distributing their signal through uh, Colorado on uh, terrestrial microwave links. And uh, so I called a company that was known as called TCI at the time, Telecommunications Inc. Um, and uh, the guy who answered said, uh, I, I said, explained why I was calling. And he said, well, you need to talk to John. Uh, well, this John came on the phone in, in just a very courteous, almost flat, low-key uh, low tone of voice. Uh, kind of explained to me what was going on and how they had an arrangement that... Uh, public radio had arrangement with the schools and they were using their microwaves and all that and uh and i realized it was going to work for me uh or us uh but only later i had been realized I, I realized that i've been talking to a guy named john malone uh, who is now the billionaire chairman of liberty media uh he's according to one source the largest private land owner in the u.s and uh belong his, uh, i'd say beyond his philanthropy I know nothing about John Mullen's personal faith. I guess he lives in Elizabeth. Um, but that brief encounter with him at that time just impressed with me uh, that the, the verse that we're looking at is very true for success to all of life, even in secular business. As we move to verse 6, strategic living is about your speech, where it says, let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I was just really impressed that, that this very successful businessman, very well off, would take the time to talk with me and explain things in the manner that he did. And the, the word for conversation, the word logos is that particular word there, and Paul is using about our choice of words when we speak. And first of all, they're to be always full of grace. So it's about gracious speech, full of grace. The story is told many years ago about the famous coach Don Shula, who lost his temper near a mic that happened to be on, said some things that he regretted greatly. And uh, letters came from all over the country voicing their people's disappointment with many who had respected him for his integrity. And uh, the article I got this from basically says, Shula could have given excuses, but he didn't. 
Everyone who included a return address received a personal apology. He closed each letter by stating, I value your respect and will do my best to earn it again. They observed there's two ways to gain respect. One is to act nobly. The other is when you fail to do so, to make no excuses. And so to be full of grace here, the idea is to mean, mean that our talk, our conversation, our language uh, should be such as to show that we're recipients of the grace of God. In an objective sense, it means that which causes favorable regard has to do with gracefulness, loveliness of form, and graciousness. Of course, the opposite of that offensive speech can cause irreparable harm, a thoughtless comment, words that are just blurted out even unintentionally with no thought to injury at all are are not words full of grace. And so we have to be very careful. I do. (laughs) When I'm angry, uh, even when we try to be humorous, Sometimes we say things we don't mean or don't intend to, and and we assume that the other person understands us and even our humor. Uh, As uh, Proverbs 26, verses uh, 18 and 19, like a madman shooting firebrands or deadly arrows is a man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. I was only joking. And to the contrary, of course, our speech, even want to be humorous, is to be full of grace, seasoned with salt, Spent four years in the Navy. I heard my share of salty language. And unfortunately, even Christians sometimes can get deceived in this uh, particular area, somehow feeling perhaps that it's even hypocritical or legalistic to clean up the talk. Uh, I've even heard of some churches where the pastor in a clumsy attempt to somehow to be authentic or relevant uses profane language to communicate or some such thing. Uh, Dr. L. Nelson Bell, who is Billy Graham's father-in-law, once warned, that a person who freely uses hell, damn, and devil in his conversation may well be reminding himself of his destination, his condition, and his master. Ooh, ooh. (laughs) So it's about tasteful speech, seasoned with salt. And of course, uh, the salty language of culture is polar opposite to what scriptures command in terms of seasoned speech. According to the commentator Barnes, salt among the Greeks was the emblem of wit. Here the meaning seems to be their conversation should be seasoned with piety or grace in a way similar to that which we employ salt in our food. It makes it wholesome and palatable. Of course, Solomon said the words of the wise are like goads, they're collected sayings like firmly embedded, or in other translations puts it, well-driven nails. And of course, the object of gracious, well-seasoned speech, of course, if we would be living strategically, is that so that you may know how to answer everyone as we work our way along here, hopefully. There we go. It's about well-prepared speech. So that you may know how to answer everyone. Uh, This last week, some of you know I have a a part-time job doing test driving. And uh, I was uh, refueling the test van, a, a Mercedes Sprinter, uh, at the Shell station up at 44th and Kipling. And uh, um, there's a lot of homeless people up around there. And a middle-aged woman, missing teeth, kind of poorly dressed, uh, came up to me. And, and, uh, but, but yet she was very articulate in her speech. And she said, uh, may I have a dollar, please? Uh, I, I need money for my motel room tonight. And uh, I said, well, yes, just a minute, uh, as uh, Jesus' words about uh, giving to those who ask of you were, were resonating in my head. And so I went around to the other side where I had my wallet, and I gave her what I had, a small amount of cash. And she thanked me, and, uh, and then I just said to her, I, I, I guess the Lord was really gracious to me at the time. I said, well, did you know that Jesus died on the cross and rose again so that if you believe in him, you can have eternal life for eternity? And uh, she said, yes. I agree with fully with every word you're saying. And then just quickly walked away. She just disappeared. And uh, as I thought about it, that was my one brief opportunity to share the gospel. And, and the Lord was very gracious to give me words for the moment. And because there's so many other times I've gone away from conversation, thought, oh, if only I'd said that differently. Uh, in fact, I get a chance to, to do that every Sunday after preaching. <laughs> But the Apostle Paul, or Peter, I should say, says, But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you 
to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Do we want to live strategically? Do we want to live strategically in the manner of life in which we walk, in which we speak? Well, I'd suggest these verses from the Apostle Paul to Colossians apply to us even in the 21st century in that regard. Uh, Let me close with uh, these words from John Hall, actually quoting from uh, Pastor Philip Green in a prayer by him in closing. It says, Is anybody happier because you passed his way? Does anyone remember that you spoke to him today? Is a single heart rejoicing over what you did or said? Does the man whose hopes were fading now with courage look ahead? The day is almost over and its toiling time is through. Is there anyone to utter now a kindly word of you? Did you waste the day or lose it? Was it well or sorely spent? Did you leave a trail of kindness or a scar of discontent? I guess I'm supposed to close in prayer, right? So let's all stand together and uh, let me use actually a written prayer from uh, Pastor Philip Green. Lord, help us to redeem the time, especially in our relationships with others in this world. Give us opportunities this week to share the good news about Jesus and use us to bring people to true and genuine faith in Him. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Thanks for the privilege to be with you today.